morning. morning and welcome to all of you here in the sanctuary with us and those of you at home. Um, just happy birthday, America. What a blessing that we can be here together. And I hope that today we all remember why we have the liberties to be here in church and everything. And just thank God and God bless America. So if you join me in the opening prayer. Almighty God, you sustain your people with manna in the wilderness and with bread and fish by the Sea of Galilee. Sustain us today, not only with physical food, but also with spiritual food, with the bread of life, who is our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. And you can stand as you are able and join me in singing America the Beautiful, number 696 in your hymnal. Jesus, who gave himself 
as a ransom for all people. This has now been witnessed to at the proper time, and for this purpose I was appointed a herald and an apostle. I am telling the truth, I am not lying, and a true and faithful teacher of the Gentiles. And now if you'd stand for the reading of the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 21, verses 18 to 22. Early in the morning, as Jesus was on his way back to the city, he was hungry. Seeing a fig tree by the road, he went up to it, but found nothing on it except leaves. Then he said to it, May you never bear fruit again. And immediately the tree withered. When the disciples saw this, they were amazed. How did the fig tree wither so quickly? they asked. And Jesus replied, Truly I tell you, if you have faith and do not doubt it, not only can you do what was done to the fig tree, but also you can say to this mountain, Go, throw yourself into the sea, and it will be done. If you believe, you will receive whatever you ask for in prayer. This is the word of God for the people of God. Praise be to God. Independence Day to all of us here. It's so amazing that we we live in a country that we can we can freely pray, we can freely worship, we can freely talk about our God um, without fear. Uh, there may be people who look at us cross-eyed, but that's okay. And they finally know the truth of the living Lord. How amazed that they will be too that they have this privilege. We are independent enough to, to be able to, to do that. And yet, even though we live in a country where we are free to do that, um, we kind of get confused about how religion and patriotism work together and not together, how they are separate, and yet um, we just kind of start blending it in. And it's important that we make that distinguish, distinction where our patriotism is and where our faith is. Um, because there's this little thing called civil religion. And you may not have heard that term before, but it's been with us a long time. And I'm going to help us define that, but also to help us define what our faith does for our country. And, and so Jesus was getting a little bit of that, um, and I want to get to what I, I got a marker board up here, so I want a little bit of interaction today. So those of you that are online um, and those in the pews, you may be thinking about how you would respond. And so at the end, I want to I want to put on this marker board our prayers for the America. I'm going to just abbreviate USA. So what I'd like us to think about is is what we would actually pray for. Um, so we, we, we say God bless America a lot. Um, and it means something different to each of us, okay? So in our psalm, he's praying for Jerusalem. And that one line from verse 6, pray for the peace of Jerusalem, that those who love you may be secure. He's taken that prayer and kind of um, elongated a little bit. It's not just about peace, because peace comes in different forms. Um, you would talk about, you know, peace meaning um, that they're, they could be taken over by another um, authority, and there would be peace in the land, but they wouldn't have their independence. There could be peace in the land where there is no war, and they have their own um, sovereignty, but it could go the other way. So praying for peace is kind of a a small prayer. So we're going to make that prayer bigger by saying what we use, what we really want. May those who love you be secure, not afraid for their lives. Now that still could come in a couple forms. But as it goes on, he, he's also saying, and I will say, peace be within you for the sake of the house of the Lord. Peace be within you. Our second passage there also talks about prayers for kings and those in authority. And it's a little more specific than just pray for your president or pray for your governor. Um, because our prayers for those 
uh, individual politicians may not always be a nice prayer, um, but it talks about prayers, intercessions, petitions, thanksgivings made for all people. And saying thanksgiving reminds us that we need to thank God that we have these persons in power, that they are doing what is just and fair, that we also have the right to, to petition them, to ask them to do something different. We have the right to vote against them. We have the right to you know, make, our, um, make our family situation known to them. We have all that right. We, we can even, in our prayer life, which may have the most power of all, remind God that this politician is not following the precepts of Christianity as we see them. That Jesus would say that this politician might need to be replaced. He, we're free to do that in our prayer life. We're free to make that specific. But what, what, what it doesn't say here is, um, is that you won't have a king or a person of authority. It doesn't say that there won't be a governor. There always will be. And what, how did Jesus do it when, he, when they were questioning about taxes? You know, is our loyalty totally to the ministry or is it to the, of the, the governor? And he said, well, give me a coin. And he looked at the coin and says, whose face is on this? And they said, Caesar's. And he says, well, then pay Caesar what is due Caesar and pay to God what is due God. There's this acceptance by Jesus when he talked to us that there would be um, a, a nation state and there would be a, a God state, a God um, mindset. And as we try to do both, Standing in America with all our freedoms, it's, it's important that we don't try to blend that together and say that because there are Christian principles in our Constitution, then we have a Christian nation. There is freedom of religion, always has been. But as these things get blended together, this thing called civil religion started way back. We learned about, I had a whole class on this in seminary some time ago, I don't think things have changed that much. We learned about this preacher back in 1640. We picked apart his sermons. His name was Jonathan Winthrop. He was the guy who talked about the city on the hill, the manifest destiny of America. And as that kind of came into being, yeah, over 100 years later, at 1776, we just took that and just kind of went off with it and found that our, our church and our faith were, were combined in a way that was was a little bit unhealthy because we started just railroading over other peoples and not even paying attention to the Constitution that talks about all people created equal. Now, it went further than that because when we got into driving ourselves out to, to California and conquering the whole land regardless of, of the indigenous people there, we. You know, we, we just kind of got on that railroad, and you know, any kind of calling always has to have a savior too. So we made one up. We kind of ignored the Jesus part and made the cowboy and the white hat the one who would save the day. And it was always a guy in the white hat, right? The black hat was the, the bad guy and the white hat was the good guy. And I know some of you have black cowboy hats, I'm sorry. Just the way it was. Not now. We've evolved from that. And where do we evolve to? You're going to laugh at this one. Um, my professor, uh, Robert Jewett, a New Testament uh, professor, had, did amazing work on St. Paul, but also wrote a book called Captain America. And in, 19, um, in the 40s, we took that comic book character and put him into movies. And so the, in the movie, he could do no wrong. And, and now that we've resurrected him, he's still 27 years old, even though I think technically he's 103. Um, but he was frozen for 66 years, apparently. So he can do no wrong. He conquers, a, conquers the, the world, um, the, the enemy, and, and brings um, everything back to normal. Um, I haven't seen the recent movies, but I have gone through some of the comic book stories and stuff like that. And, that, that whole idea of a savior is still with us. 
And we forget to turn to Jesus. We turn then to a person. Okay, so it's going to be my politician of my party that's going to save my, save everybody. And, and if you don't believe that, then you, you're missing the point. And we get to morph our thoughts about Jesus, Christian thoughts about Jesus, into a person on earth as if they could do what Jesus does. They can't. They're human. What Jesus does is, is see with the mindset of God what is not just today's picture, but all eternity's picture. What is, what is not just good for the one, but for the community. Jesus could see something in that gospel lesson that we were missing. We're aghast that he like condemned this fig tree and saying, you will never bear fruit again. And through the power of his voice, that fig tree withered and died. Now I imagine standing with him, they were so amazed because who has that power? Of course, something other than a human being. Now, he didn't save the tree. He, he fulfilled that tree's destiny and let him die quickly so that another tree could be planted and another fruit could be planted. We didn't see that because we didn't know what the destiny was. And then he says, and this is the amazing part, we, we take this to mean that, that people can have the power of God, but that's not true. Truly, if you have faith, and you do not doubt, only, not only can you do the, what was done to the fig tree, but you could also say the mountain, to the mountain, go throw yourself into the sea. If you believe, you will receive what you ask in prayer. Okay, now that's, that's an important part. If you believe means what? If you believe means that you go to prayer with God and listen to God. You're, you're connected to that Holy Spirit, and, and if you don't feel connected, you ask to be connected because God's never going to not answer that prayer. Double negative. I get that. He's going to answer the prayer that says, Lord, I want to see you. I want to hear you. I want to know your will. And as we try to connect with God and connect his will, what are we saying when we pray, God, bless America? What would God bless America with? Would God bless America with what we think God should bless America with? No flooding, no um, forest fires, <coughs> even temperature heat. No, sometimes God's going to challenge us. Would God bless America with the perfect president? If that even exists, I don't think it does. It does. God's going to bless America for what God needs. And we've been saying that prayer, God bless America, for a long time without any specifics behind it. So that prayer, that prayer was actually created in 1917 by Irving Berlin, the song that we're going to sing at the end, God Bless America. It was a poem. That poem spoke to his heart. He was an immigrant. He was, looking, he was a songwriter. He was now in the military, and they were put on a shelf. And so he was going to make a new song for that shelf. Well, we know Irving Berlin's so talented that he didn't have to, you know, whatever he created, he could use it or not. He chose to not. He put it in a drawer and just let it go for 20 years. So in 1938, he takes it out again and says, well, <clears throat> now 1938, Hitler is, is running all over Europe and threatening we're starting to get into this war here. And uh, so he said, we, we need to focus on what I was loving about America and not the militarization of America. And so he, he put this, the poem and the lyrics, or the tune out there um, for publication. And um, they published it. About the same time, another person was looking for a song to sing. Kate Smith was her name. And Kate had a, a terrible reputation. She had a show, I mean, she has a great voice, but she was picking songs that were racist, which is awful. And so she needed to fix her reputation. And she asked her uh, 
agent to look for a song. She, he found this one. She sang it, and it became, as you know, her her life story. So you say Kate Smith, it's like you say it Kate God was America. I remember that for that amazing voice. But it wasn't about Kate Smith. It was about Irving Berlin, really, and his passion, his love for America. In 1940, he he was on. Um, I believe it was a TV show, um, interviewed, and he said, this is not a patriotic song. This song is about the passion for our land and what we love. And that now we have, you know, made it again, the same as a patriotic song, so we're angry if someone doesn't stand for God bless America or, the, or chooses because it's the seven minute stretch and I've been waiting for that. You know, to, to use the little girls and boys room out in the, the lobby. You know, we get mad at that, and I'm going, how, how can you? Because it wasn't supposed to be a patriotic song. Now, there's some, um, there's some ballparks that have decided not to use it at all, and it's because of Kate Smith's history, rather than Irving Berlin's history. And that's also being debated. See how it gets caught up? It's not supposed to be a song that takes us into civil religion looking for the Savior to make our life a better place. It's about reminding us of the land we love and the people we love and why, why we're here in the first place in this land. We could go around the world, other places. I, you're either, we're all immigrants. I'm a Third generation immigrant from Sweden and Norway, you know, and there's you could also trace your, your history. How far back do you go before you know you're an immigrant? Because we're none of us here that I can see are indigenous. But as we come to this land and we love what we see, we love the green of this black earth. We're surprised when we go south and it's more clay-like and red. We love the mountains because they're out of the plains, they're suddenly huge rising out for us. And we love our people, determined, ready to do anything. If we put our minds to it, if we work together, we are a wonderful nation. A wonderful nation, a great nation. But even that work is not exactly what we want to do. Because God could make us great and have no moral conviction. God could make us great through another nation conquering us. God could make us great by humbling us. Because I think that's kind of what God wants for us. It's people who believe. Believe in him and his salvation over anything.